I'm going to try to keep these intros a little short. Hi there, I'm your imaginary friend. This is going to be a reading of a chapter from Supernatural Horror in Literature by Howard Phillips Lovecraft. Howard Phillips Lovecraft, as you may know, was a little bit of a racist and a xenophobe, so keep your own eyes out for anything of that nature. Uh, and also, just kind of in general, Victorian fiction or fiction of that era, um, be beware that it is a product of its time. Uh, last but not least, I'm going to be trying to do readings of all of the works that he cites in, in these chapters, and so if I've gotten to anything from this chapter, look for a link at the end to a playlist. Thanks, and enjoy. Chapter 8. The Weird Tradition in America the public for whom Poe wrote, though grossly unappreciative of his art, was by no means unaccustomed to the horrors with which he dealt. America, besides inheriting the usual dark folklore of Europe, had an additional fund of weird associations to draw upon, so that spectral legends had already been recognized as fruitful subject matter for literature. Charles Brockton Brown had achieved phenomenal fame with his Radcliffian romances, and Washington Irving's lighter treatment of eerie themes had quickly become classic. This additional fund proceeded, as Paul Elmer Moore has pointed out, from the keen spiritual and theological interests of the first colonists, plus the strange and forbidding nature of the scene into which they were plunged. The vast and gloomy virgin forests in whose perpetual twilight all terrors might well lurk, the hordes of coppery Indians, whose strange Saturnine visages and violent customs hinted strongly at traces of infernal origin, the free reign given under the influence of Puritan theocracy to all manner of notions respecting man's relation to the stern and vengeful god of the Calvinists, and to the sulfurious adversary of that god, about whom so much was thundered in the pulpits each Sunday, and the morbid introspection developed by an isolated backwoods life devoid of normal amusements and of the recreational mood, harassed by commands for theological self-examination, keyed to unnatural emotional repression, and forming above all a mere grim struggle for survival, all these things conspired to produce an environment in which the black whisperings of sinister grand dams were heard far beyond the chimney corner, and in which tales of witchcraft and unbelievable secret monstrosities lingered long after the dread days of the Salem nightmare. Poe represents the newer, more disillusioned, and more technically finished of the weird schools that rose out of this propitious milieu. Another school, the tradition of moral values, gentle restraint, and mild leisurely fantasy, tinged more or less with the whimsical, was represented by another famous, misunderstood, and lonely figure in American letters, the shy and sensitive Nathaniel Hawthorne, scion of antique Salem and great-grandson of one of the bloodiest of the old witchcraft judges. In Hawthorne we have none of the violence, the daring, the high coloring, the intense dramatic sense, the cosmic malignity, and the undivided and impersonal artistry of Poe. Here instead is a gentle soul cramped by the Puritanism of early New England, shadowed and wistful and grieved at an unmoral universe which everywhere transcends the conventional patterns thought by our forefathers to represent divine and immutable law evil, a very real force to Hawthorne, appears on every hand as a lurking and conquering adversary, and the visible world becomes, in his fancy, a theater of infinite tragedy and woe, and unseen half-existent influences hovering over it and through it, battling for supremacy and molding the destinies of the hapless mortals who form its vain and self-deluded population. The heritage of American weirdness was his to a more intense degree, and he saw a dismal throng of vague specters behind the common phenomena of life. But he was not disinterested enough 
to value impressions, sensations, and beauties of narration for their own sake. He must needs weave his fantasy into some quietly melancholy fabric of didactic or allegorical cast, in which his meekly resigned cynicism may display with naive moral appraisal the perfidy of a human race which he cannot cease to cherish and mourn despite his insight into its hypocrisy. Supernatural horror, then, is never a primary object with Hawthorne though its impulses were so deeply woven into his personality that he cannot help suggesting it with the force of genius when he calls upon the unreal world to illustrate the pensive sermon he wishes to preach. Hawthorne's intimations of the weird, always gentle, elusive, and restrained, may be traced throughout his work. The mood that produced them found one delightful event in the teutonized retelling of the classic myths for children contained in A Wonder Book and Tanglewood Tales, and at other times exercised itself in casting a certain strangeness in intangible witchery or malevolence over events not meant to be actually supernatural, as in the macabre post posthumous novel Dr. Grimshaw's Secret, which invests with a peculiar sort of repulsion, a house existing to this day in Salem, and abutting on the ancient Charter Street burying ground. In the marble fawn, whose design was sketched out in an Italian villa reputed to be haunted, a tremendous background of genuine fantasy and mystery palpitates just beyond the common reader's sight, and glimpses of fabulous blood in mortal veins are hinted at during the course of a romance which cannot help being inter interesting despite the persistent incubus of moral allegory, anti-popery propaganda, and a Puritan prudery which has caused the modern writer D. H. Lawrence to express a longing to treat the author in a highly undignified manner. Septimus Felton, a posthumous novel whose idea was to have been elaborated and incorporated into the unfinished Dolliver romance, touches on the elixir of life in a more or less capable fashion, whilst the notes for a never-written tale to be called The Ancestral Footstep show what Hawthorne would have done with an intensive treatment of an old English superstition, that of an ancient and accursed line whose members left footprints of blood as they walked, which appears incidentally in both Septimus Felton and Dr. Grimshaw's Secret. Many of Hawthorne's shorter tales exhibit weirdness, either of atmosphere or of incident, to a remarkable degree. Edward Randolph's portrait in Legends of the Province House has its diabolic moments. The minister's black veil, founded on an actual incident, and the ambitious guest imply much more than they state, whilst Ethan Brand, a fragment of a longer work never completed, rises to genuine heights of cosmic fear with its vignette of the wild hill country and the blazing, desolate lime kilns and its delineation of the Byronic, unpardonable sinner, whose troubled life ends with a peal of fearful laughter in the night as he seeks rest amidst the flames of the furnace. Some of Hawthorne's notes tell of weird tales he would have written had he lived longer an especially vivid plot being that concerning a baffling stranger who appeared now and then in public assemblies, and who was at last followed and found to come and go from a very ancient grave. But foremost as a finished artistic unit among all our author's weird material is the famous and exquisitely wrought novel The House of Seven Gables, in which the relentless working out of an ancestral curse is developed with astonishing power against the sinister background of a very ancient Salem house, one of those peaked Gothic affairs which formed the first regular building up of our New England coast towns, but which gave way after the 17th century to the more familiar gambrel-roofed or classic Georgian types, now known as colonial. Of these old... Of these old gabled Gothic houses, scarcely a dozen are to be seen today in their original condition throughout the United States, 
but one well known to Hawthorne still stands in Turner Street, Salem, and is pointed out with doubtful authority as the scene and inspiration of the romance. Such an edifice, with its spectral peaks, its clustered chimneys, its overhanging second story, its grotesque corner brackets, and its diamond paned lattice windows, is indeed an object well calculated to evoke somber reflections, typifying as it does the dark Puritan age of concealed horror and witch whispers which preceded the beauty, nationality, and spaciousness of the 18th century. <clears throat> Hawthorne saw many in his youth, and knew the black tales connected with some of them. He heard too many rumors of a curse upon his own line, as the result of his great-grandfather's severity as a witchcraft judge in 1692. From this setting came the immortal tale, New England's greatest contribution to weird literature, and we can feel in an instant the authenticity of the atmosphere presented to us. Stealthy horror and disease lurk within the weather-blackened, moss-crusted, and elm-shadowed walls of the archaic dwelling so vividly displayed, and we grasp the brooding malignity of the place when we read that its builder, old Colonel Pincham, snatched the land with peculiar ruthlessness from its original settler, Matthew Maul, whom he condemned to the gallows as a wizard in the year of the panic. Maul died cursing old Pincheon. God will give him blood to drink. And the waters of the old well on the seized land turned bitter. Maul's carpenter's son consented to build the great gabled house for his father's triumphant enemy, but the old colonel died strangely on the day of its dedication. Then followed generations of odd vicissitudes with queer whispers about the dark powers of the Mauls, and sometimes terrible ends befalling the Pincheons. The overshadowing malevolence of the ancient house, almost as alive as Poe's House of Usher, though in a subtler way, pervades the tale as a recurrent motif pervades an operatic tragedy. And when the main story is reached, we behold the modern Pincheons in a pitiable state of decay. Poor old Hepzibah, the eccentric reduced gentlewoman, childlike, unfortunate Clifford, just released from undeserved imprisonment, sly and treacherous Judge Pincheon, who is the old colonel all over again. All these figures are tremendous symbols, and are well matched by the stunted vegetation and anemic fowls in the garden. It was almost a pity to supply a fairly happy ending, with a union of sprightly Phoebe, cousin and last scion of the Pincheons, to the prepossessing young man who turns out to be the last of the Mauls. This union presumably ends the curse. Hawthorne avoids all violence of diction or of movement and keeps his implications of terror well in the background, but occasional glimpses simply serve to sustain the mood and redeem the work from pure allegorical aridity. Incidents like the bewitching of Alice Pynchon in the early 18th century and the spectral music of her harpsichord which precedes a death in the family, the latter a variant of an immemorial type of Aryan myth, link the action directly with the supernatural, whilst the dead nocturnal vigil of old Judge Pynchon in the ancient parlor with his frightfully ticking watch, his stark horror in the most poignant and genuine sort. The way in which the judge's death is first adumbrated by the motions and sniffing of a strange cat outside the window, long before the fact is suspected by the reader or by any of the characters, is a stroke of genius which Poe could not have surpassed. Later, the strange cat watches intently outside that same window in the night and on the next day for something. It is clearly the psychopomp of primeval myth, fitted and adapted when, with infinite deftness to its latter-day setting. But Hawthorne left no well-defined literary posterity. His mood and attitude belonged to the age which closed with him, and it is the spirit of Poe who so clearly and realistically understood the natural basis of the horror appeal and the correct mechanics of its achievement, which survived and blossomed. 
Among the earliest of Poe's disciples may be reckoned the brilliant young Irishman Fitz James O'Brien, 1828-1862, who became naturalized as an American and perished honorably in the Civil War. It is he who gave us, what was it? The first well-shaped short story of a tangible but invisible being, and the prototype of de Maupassant's Horla. He also who created the inim inimitable diamond lens, in which a young micros microscopist falls in love with a maiden of an infinitesimal world which he has discovered in a drop of water. O'Brien's early death undoubtedly deprived us of some masterful tales of strangeness and terror, though his genius was not, properly speaking, of the same titan quality which characterized Poe and Hawthorne. Closer to real greatness was the eccentric and Saturnian journalist Ambrose Bierce, born in 1842, who likewise entered the Civil War, but survived to write some immortal tales and to disappear in 1913 in as great a cloud of mystery as any he ever evoked from his nightmare fantasy. Bierce was a satirist and pamphleteer of note, but the bulk of his artistic reputation must rest upon his grim and savage short stories, a large number of which deal with the Civil War, and form the most vivid and realistic expression which that conflict has yet received in fiction. Virtually all of Bierce's tales are tales of horror, and whilst many of them treat only of the physical and psychological horrors within nature, a substantial proportion admit the malignly supernatural and form a leading element in America's fund of weird literature. Mr. Samuel Loveman, a living poet and critic who was personally acquainted with Bierce, thus sums up the genius of the great shadow maker in the preface to some of his letters. <clears throat> in Bierce, the evocation of horror becomes for the first time not so much the prescription or prevention of Poe and Montpassant, but an atmosphere definite and uncannily precise. Words so simple that one would be prone to ascribe them to the limitations of a literary hack take on an unholy horror, a new and unguessed transformation. In Poe, one finds it a tour de force. In Maupassant, a nervous engagement of the flagellated climax. To Bierce, simply and sincerely, diabolism held in its tormented depth a legitimate and reliant means to the end. Yet a tacit confirmation with nature is in every instance insisted upon. In the death of Halpin Fraser, flowers, verdure, and the boughs and leaves of trees are magnificently placed as an opposing foil to unnatural malignity. Not the accustomed golden world, but a world pervaded with the mystery of blue and the breathless recalcitrance of dreams is Bierce's. Yet curiously, inhumanity is not altogether absent. The inhumanity mentioned by Mr. Loveman finds vent in a rare strain of sardonic comedy and graveyard humor, and a kind of delight in images of cruelty and tantalizing disappointment. The former quality is well illustrated by some of the subtitles in the darker narratives, such as One Does Not Always Eat What Is On The Table, describing a body laid out for a coroner's inquest, and A Man, Though Naked, may be in rags, referring to a frightfully mangled corpse. Bierce's work is, in general, somewhat uneven. Many of the stories are obviously mechanical and marred by a jaunty and commonplacely artificial style derived from journalistic models, but the grim malevolence stalking through all of them is unmistakable, and several stand out as permanent mountain peaks of American weird writing. The death of Halpin Fraser, called by Frederick Tabor Cooper the most fiendishly ghastly tale in the literature of the Anglo-Saxon race, tells of a body skulking by night without a soul in a weird and horribly ensanguined wood, and of a man beset by ancestral memories who met death at the claws of that which had been his fervently loved mother. The Diamond Thing, frequently copied in popular anthologies, 
chronicles the hideous devastations of an invisible entity that waddles and flounders on the hills and in the wheat fields by night and day. The suitable surroundings evokes with singular subtlety yet apparent simplicity a piercing sense of the terror which may reside in the written word. In the story, the weird author Colston says to his friend Marsh, You are brave enough to read me in a streetcar, but in a deserted house, alone, in the forest, at night? I have a manuscript in my pocket that would kill you. Marsh reads the manuscript in The Suitable Surroundings, and it does kill him. The middle toe of the right foot is clumsily developed, but has a powerful climax. A man named Manton has horribly killed his two children and his wife, the latter of whom lacked the middle toe of the right foot. Ten years later, he returns much altered to the neighborhood and, being secretly recognized, is provoked into a bowie knife duel in the dark to be held in the now abandoned house where his crime was committed. When the moment of the duel arrives, a trick is played upon him and he is left without an antagonist, shut in a night black ground floor room of the reputedly haunted edifice with the thick dust of a decade on every hand. No knife is drawn against him, for only a, th a, th a thorough scare is intended. But on the next day, he is found crouched in a corner with distorted face, dead of sheer fright at something he has seen. The only clue visible to the discoverers is one having terrible implications. In the dust of years that lay thick upon the floor, leading from the door by which they had entered, straight across the room to within a yard of Manton's crouching corpse were three parallel lines of footprints, light but definite impressions of bare feet, the outer ones those of small children, the inner a woman's. From the point at which they ended, they did not return. They pointed all one way. And of course, the woman's prints showed a lack of the middle toe of the right foot. The Spook House told with a severely homely air of journalistic verisimilitude, conveys terrible hints at shocking mystery. In 1858, an entire family of seven persons disappears suddenly and unaccountably from a plantation house in eastern Kentucky, leaving all its possessions untouched, furniture, clothing, food supplies, horses, cattle, and slaves. About a year later, two men of high standing are forced by a storm to take shelter in the deserted dwelling, and in so doing stumble into a strange subterranean room lit by an unaccountable greenish light, and having an iron door which cannot be opened from within. In this room lie the decayed corpse of all the missing family, and as one of the discoverers rushes forward to embrace a body he seems to recognize, the other is so overpowered by a strange fetter that he accidentally shuts his companion in the vault and loses consciousness. Recovering his senses six weeks later, the survivor is unable to find the hidden room, and the house is burned during the Civil War. The imprisoned discoverer is never seen or heard of again. Bierce seldom realizes the atmospheric possibilities of his themes as vividly as Poe, and much of his work contains a certain touch of naivete, prosaic angularity, or early American provincialism, which contrasts somewhat with the efforts of later horror masters. Nevertheless, the genuineness and artistry of his dark intimations are always unmistakable, so that his greatness is in no danger of eclipse. As arranged in his definitively collected works, Bierce's weird tales occur mainly in two volumes, Can Such Things Be? and In the Midst of Life. The former, indeed, is almost wholly given over to the supernatural. Much of the best in American horror literature has come from pens not mainly devoted to that medium. Oliver Wendell Holmes' historic Elsie Venner 
suggests with admirable restraint an unnatural ophidian element in a young woman prenatally influenced and sustains the atmosphere with finely discriminating landscape touches. In the turn of the screw, Henry James triumphs over his inevitable pomposity and prolixity sufficiently well to create a truly potent air of sinister menace, depicting the hideous influence of two dead and evil servants, Peter Quint and the governess, Miss Jewell, over a small boy and girl who had been under their care. James is perhaps too diffuse, too unctuously urbane, and too much addicted to subtleties of speech to realize fully all the wild and devastating horror in his situations. But for all that, there is a rare and mounting tide of fright, culminating in the death of the little boy, which gives the novelette a permanent place in its special class. F. Marion Crawford produced several weird tales of varying quality, now collected in a volume entitled Wandering Ghosts. For the blood is the life touches powerfully on a case of moon-cursed vampirism near an ancient tower on the rocks of the lonely South Italian seacoast. The Dead Smile treats of family horrors in an old house in an ancestral vault in Ireland and introduces the Banshee with considerable force. The Upper Birth however, is Crawford's weird masterpiece and is one of the most tremendous horror stories in all literature. In this tale of suicide-haunted staterooms, such things as the spectral saltwater dampness, the strangely open porthole, and the nightmare struggle with the nameless object are handled with incomparable dexterity. Very genuine, though not without the typical mannered extravagance of the 1890s, is the strain of horror in the early work of Robert W. Chambers, since renowned for products of a very different quality. The King in Yellow, a series of vaguely connected short stories, having as a background a monstrous and suppressed book whose perusal brings fright, madness, and spectral tragedy really achieves notable heights of cosmic fear, in spite of uneven interest and a somewhat trivial and affected cultivation of the Gallic studio atmosphere made popular by de Molière's Trilby. The most powerful of its tales, perhaps, is the yellow sign, in which is introduced a silent and terrible churchyard watchman with a face like a puffy grave worm's. A boy describing a tussle he has had with this creature shivers and sickens as he relates a certain detail. Well, sir, it's God's truth that when I hit him, he grabbed me wrist, sir, and when I twisted his soft, mushy fist, one of his fingers come off in me hand. An artist, who, after seeing him, has shared with another a strange dream of a nocturnal hearse, is shocked by the voice with which the watchman accosts him. The fellow emits a muttering sound that fills the head like thick, oily smoke from a fat-rendering vat or an odor of noisome decay. What he mumbles is merely this. Have you found the yellow sign? A weirdly hydroglyphed onyx talisman, picked up on the street by the sharer of his dream, is shortly given the artist, and after stumbling clearly upon the hellish and forbidden book of horrors, the two learn, among other hideous things, which no sane mortal should know, that this talisman is indeed the nameless yellow sign, handed down from the accursed cult of Hastur, from primordial Carcosa, whereof the volume treats, and some nightmare memory of which seeks to lurk latent and ominous at the back of all men's minds. Soon they hear the rumblings of the black-plumed hearse driven by the flabby and corpse-faced watchman. He enters the night-shrouded house in quest of the yellow sign, all bolts and bars rotting at his touch, and when the people rush in, 
drawn by a scream that no human throat could utter, they find three forms on the floor, two dead and one dying. One of the dead shapes is far gone in decay. It is the churchyard watchman, and the doctor exclaims, That man must have been dead for months. It is worth observing that the author derives most of the names and allusions connected with his eldritch land of primal memory from the tales of Ambrose Pierce. Other early works of Mr. Chambers displaying the outre and macabre element are The Maker of Moons and In Search of the Unknown. One cannot help regretting that he did not further develop a vein in which he could so easily have become a recognized master. Horror material of authentic force may be found in the work of the New England realist Mary E. Wilkins, whose volume of short tales, The Wind in the Rosebush, contain, contains a number of noteworthy accomplishments. In The Shadows on the Wall, we are shown with consummate skill the response of a staid New England household to uncanny tragedy, and the sourceless shadow of the poisoned brother well prepare us for the climactic moment when the shadow of the secret murderer who has killed himself in a neighboring city suddenly appears beside it. Charlotte Perkins Gilman, in the yellow wallpaper, rises to a classic level in subtly delineating the madness which crawls over a woman dwelling in the most in the hideously papered room where a mad woman was once confined. In the Dead Valley, the eminent architect and medievalist Ralph Adams Cran achieves a memorably potent degree of vague regional horror through subtleties of atmosphere and description. Still further carrying on our spectral tradition is the gifted and versatile humorist Irvin S. Cobb, whose work both early and recent contains some finely weird specimens. Fishhead an early achievement, is banefully effective in its portrayal of unnatural affinities between a hybrid idiot and the strange fish of an isolated lake, which at the, at the last avenge their biped kinsman's murder. Later work of Mr. Cobb introduces an element of possible science, as in the tale of hereditary memory, where a modern man with a negroid strain utters words in African jungle speech when run down by a train under visual and oral circumstances recalling the maiming of his black ancestor by a rhinoceros a century before. Extremely high in artistic stature is the novel The Dark Chamber, 1927, by the late Leonard Klein. This is the tale of a man who, with his characteristic ambition of the Gothic or Byronic hero-villain, seeks to defy nature and recapture every moment of his past life, through the abnormal stimulation of memory. To this end, he employs endless notes, records, mnemonic objects and pictures, and finally odors, music, and exotic drugs. At last, his ambition goes beyond his personal life and reaches toward the black abysses of hereditary memory, even back to pre-human days amidst the steaming swamps of the Carboniferous Age and to still more unimaginable deeps of primal time and entity. He calls for matter music and takes stranger drugs, and finally his great dog grows oddly afraid of him. A noxious animal stench encompasses him, and he grows vacant-faced and subhuman. In the end, he takes to the woods, howling at night beneath windows. He is finally found in a thicket, mangled to death. Beside him is the mangled corpse of his dog. They have killed each other. The atmosphere of this novel is malevolently potent, much attention being paid to the central figure's sinister home and household. A less subtle and well-balanced, but nevertheless highly effective creation is Herbert S. German's novel, The Place Called Dagon, which relates the dark history of a western Massachusetts backwater where the descendants of refugees from the Salem witchcraft still keep alive the morbid and degenerate horrors of the Black Sabbath. Sinister House, by Leland Hall, has touches of magnificent atmosphere, but is marred by a somewhat mediocre romanticism. 
Very notable in their way are some of the weird conceptions of the novelist and short story writer Edward Lucas White, uh, most of whose themes arise from actual dreams. The Song of the Siren has a very persuasive strangeness, while such things as Lukundu and the Snout arouse darker apprehensions. Mr. White imparts a very peculiar quality to his tales, an oblique sort of glamour, which has its own distinctive type of convincingness. Of younger Americans, none strikes the note of cosmic horror so well as the California poet, artist, and fictionist Clark Adams Ashton Smith, whose bizarre writing, drawings, paintings, and stories are the delight of a sensitive few. Mr. Smith has for his background a universe of remote and paralyzing fright, jungles of poisonous and iridescent blossoms on the moons of Saturn, evil and grotesque temples in Atlantis, Lemuria, and forgotten elder worlds, and dank morasses of spotted death fungi in spectral countries beyond Earth's rim. His longest and most ambitious poem, The Hashish Eater, is in pentameter blank verse and opens up chaotic and incredible vistas of kaleidoscopic nightmare in the spaces between the stars. In sheer demonic strangeness and fertility of conception, Mr. Smith is perhaps unexcelled by any other writer dead or living. Who else has seen such gorgeous, luxuriant, and feverishly distorted visions of infinite sphere and multiple dimensions and lived to tell the tale? His short stories deal powerfully with other galaxies, worlds, and dimensions, as well as with strange religions, regions, and eons on the Earth. He tells of primal Hyperborea and its black amorphous god Sathogwa, and of the lost continent Zothik, and of the fabulous vampire-cursed land of Averwam in medieval France. Some of Mr. Smith's best work can be found in the brochure entitled The Double Shadow and Other Fantasies, 1933.